It's time to run through my opinions for a bunch of stuff. Hey, this is the running through of opinions, so we sing. Hey, this is Got a Lot of Breath, and I have got a lot of catching up to do. A lot of things I've been going over lately that really... I'm not really keen on the whole reviewing thing again. I am horrible. I am sick. I need to get slapped around. Okay, I'm going to bend down now. Okay, everybody just slap me in the face a few times, just like, j just to do it, because I keep on switching formats so often, I'm like, no, I'm not going to blog anymore, it's not my style, my style is sophisticated reviews, and then I'm like, eh, you know what, screw sophisticated reviews, nobody likes those, or at least I don't like, record I don't like writing them anymore, because <laughs> I can't make up my freaking mind. So we're going to go through some of the stuff I've been watching lately. Some of it exciting, some of it mediocre, some of it uh, some people might not be so keen about hearing my opinion on. But anyways, the first on my list, since I promised to do an anime review of it, is Excel Saga. Excel Saga is hilarious. Any anime fan should watch Excel Saga. It is funnier than hell. That's pretty much all you need to know about it. Um, the episodes vary in quality. Um, I tend to notice that... There are about three or four classic episodes of Excel, Excel Saga, I'd say, or maybe five, that you absolutely have to watch because they're, they're freaking hysterical. And then the rest, you know, they have their moments. There's certain episodes are better than others, but there are some, there are a couple of flops, definitely, when I was re-watching the series again. There are a couple of duds throughout the series arc. But, you know, I love the characters. Excel Excel is one of my fanboy favorites, the character because she's just so cute and insane. And cuteness and insanity are two things that go together really well, especially in an anime character. You just can't help but love somebody who is both cute and psychotic. There's something just great about that. What else could a man want? Cute and psychotic. It's just such a lovely combination. It's like pizza and peanut butter mixed with soda just drench the soda on top of the pizza and the peanut butter, and you've got a lovely root beer, peanut butter, ew, gross. What the hell am I going with there? So anyways, Excel Saga is funny if you're an anime geek and you get all the references. Um, there's quite a few little bits here that people aren't going to get. And oh, that reminds me! I, I like made such a big deal about state your opinions about Excel Saga so I can use them in my review even though I'm not going to be doing that anymore. But anyways... Some people wrote their opinions about Excel Saga, so I should probably go within my uh, little email here on YouTube and pull out some of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, l let's just move on. Oh, wow, I spent a lot of time on that particular topic. So let's talk about something else anime that I've watched recently, The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. And, oh, by the way, if I were to rate Excel Saga, I would probably give it a 3.5 out of 5 for just universal quality, and I would give it a 4 out of 5 for my own personal opinion. Because there's a difference between universal quality, which is what I think the actual quality of product is, and my own personal enjoyment of a product. For example, I probably should have given Star Trek a 4 out of 5 rather than a 4.5 out of 5. I think universal quality-wise, it's great, but not uh, fantastic or uber, uber uh, Trekgasm-ish. But it, for my own personal opinion, or my own personal experience... Star Trek was absolutely phenomenal and one of the best experiences I've had in a theater in a very long time. So, this is how I'm going to rate The Girl Who Left Through Time, although in this particular case, I do believe that the quality, the actual quality of the film and my own personal experience with the film uh, match up very well. The Girl Who Left Through Time is a time travel story that's just based off of a novel. It's actually a sequel to a novel, a bit of a spin-off in a way. It's inspired by a story which was... It wasn't The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. I think, I think it was something called The Girl Who Walked Through Time. But anyways, it's an old Japanese novel about a young woman who can time leap. It's called... Um, not The Girl... The anime is called The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. Oh, God. Listen to me. But anyways, The Girl Who Leapt Through Time is an excellent romance. Very mushy. Very romantic. Um... If you're into this sort of thing, if you like um, teenage cute um, stories, and especially if you like light science fiction, this isn't very hard sci-fi. I mean, you're not going to find anything very Star Trek-ish or very um, 
very 2001 A Space Odyssey in this, but there's definitely some interesting sci-fi concepts in this. It reminds me of, walking out of it, uh, it reminded me of, this feels like Back to the Future meets Kiki's Delivery Service is the best way I can possibly describe it. It's about this young girl who discovers that she has the power to leap back in time. And that's basically where the story goes. You can imagine the hijinks that end up happening. It's interesting because this story tries to make it a bit more realistic of what would a young girl actually do if she had the power to reverse time rather than just being, oh, time travel story. So she needs to travel too far back in time and screw up the space-time continuum. There really isn't much of that here. There isn't much, you know screwing around, having it be where she wasn't even born at all, or having it so her parents don't end up getting together, or there's no real heavy uh, Back to the Future Marty McFly, uh, Back to the Future Part 2 kind of stuff here. It's just a really, really good, touching story. Um, I definitely recommend it for teenagers as well, ages 15 through 17. They, they will probably get the most out of it, particularly young girls. I would give it a definitely a 4.5 out of 5. It was... Oh, God, I love that movie. Um, this is Got a Love Breath, and I am signing out. More opinions coming up soon, probably. Inglorious Bastards, or however you pronounce the title. I'm sure it's actually, everybody just says Inglorious Bastards, but let's consider the fact that the title is intentionally spelt wrong, and y you can have a lot of fun pronouncing that title. Inglorious Bastards, which is a new Quentin Tarantino film, and it's actually the only Quentin Tarantino film I had seen since Kill Bill. I had never seen Pulp Fiction before I saw this film, although that's been changing as of recently. I've gone back and watched all of Tarantino's stuff because of how good Inglorious Bastards was. I love this movie. I'll be honest, I just loved it. Absolutely loved it. I have had the best luck with movies um, this last month. I've watched a ton, I've rented a ton of really great stuff. I've watched a lot of really amazing classics. And Inglorious Bastards, I would say, is easily one of the best movies I've seen this year. Easily. I would say it probably is tied with Star Trek as my favorite movie so far this year. Um, both are excellent, excellent times at the movies. Um, but I think Star Trek was probably a bit more transcendent. It, it touched me a bit more just because I was such a big Trek geek and I had my little Trek flyers and my little, my little Trek phaser and everything and... With Inglorious Bastards, it's like, I wasn't excited to see a Quentin Tarantino film. All I had seen before that point was the first Kill Bill, which honestly didn't leave all that grave an impression on me. And I watched Inglorious Bastards, and I was expecting a lot of random chaos and mayhem and bloodshed and people dying everywhere. And Inglorious Bastards is actually a really thoughtful, well-scripted, smart movie. It's not the stupid... Hollywood gore fest that I was expecting it to be. Because you see the trailers and it's like, oh, it's Brad Pitt and I'm going to go kill some Nazis. And then you watch the movie and it's like, wow, it really isn't just about Brad Pitt killing Nazis. In fact, that's only a small portion of the movie. The rest of it is this really smart alternative universe of World War II where you're not quite sure what's going to happen at any point in the film. One of the great things that Tarantino has done in almost all of his movies is that he really keeps you on your toes. You're not quite sure what's going to happen. He did it in Pulp Fiction. He did it in the Kill Bill films. And he really nails it here. I mean, when I was sitting in the theater, uh, there's points where I was just caught completely off guard. The movie took my breath away because there are things in this movie that you just can't possibly predict. I would say even if you're a Tarantino fan, there's probably at least going to be something that takes you off guard where you go, oh, whoa, didn't see that one coming. That's pretty messed up. That's what I love so much about this movie. Uh, the dialogue is great. Uh, I love the fact that most of it is actually speak spoken in German, and it it's subtitled. And you can never predict what's going to happen. It's, it's a World War II drama with a bit of the comic book fantastic escapism thrown in for good measure, but it is most of all a character study. And it's a character study where you can never predict what the characters are going to do. Don't you just love that? There needs to be more movies where you're like, I have no idea. 
no idea how this is going to end. That's why I love the Glorious Bastards. I say everybody needs to go see it. Uh, this is Got a Love Breath, and I am signing out. I hope, I hope, and I pray that I have touched some of you today, but not really.